on World News Tonight. UAE under attack. Abu Dhabi police said three fuel tanker trucks had exploded in the industrial Musafa area near storage facilities of the oil firm ADNOC and that a fire broke out at a construction site at Abu Dhabi International Airport. China compromised. The timing couldn't be any worse. On the cups of the Winter Olympics, China experiences its first Omicron case. Is this going to throw a wrench into the works or can the government manage to contain the problem? Game over. The Djokovic saga comes to an end. The world number one ranked tennis player may be undefeated on the tennis court, but the legal courts have bested him. Novak Djokovic goes home and will not participate in this trademark Grand Slam tournament. But for how long? Stay tuned for more updates. Festive season. Chinese markets blossom with an array of colors ahead of the Spring Festival in China, with rich selections of Lunar New Year flowers bringing shoppers to the streets. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with breaking news. Three fuel trucks exploded, killing three people and a fire broke out near Abu Dhabi airport today in what Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthi group said was an attack deep inside the United Arab Emirates. The Houthi movement, which is battling a Saudi-led coalition that includes the UAE, has frequently launched cross-border missiles and drone attacks on Saudi Arabia, but has claimed few such attacks on the UAE. This recent development could add a new dimension on the disarray in the Middle East. Now moving on to the COVID-19 updates from around the world. The Omicron variant has de was detected in Beijing just two weeks before the Olympics. At an office building in China's capital, COVID control personnel lugged boxes of pillows and bedding through the closely guarded entrance for workers stuck inside, preparing for what may be days of lockdown as Beijing rushes to prevent the spread of Omicron ahead of the Winter Olympics. A rare breach of Beijing's COVID-19 defenses. The Chinese capital has reported its first ever acknowledged case of the Omicron variant. The city's Haidian district, home to a number of tech company headquarters, is now the site of a massive test and tracing effort. With the opening of the Winter Olympics just over two weeks away, Chinese authorities have zealously sought to safeguard Beijing from COVID outbreaks, forbidding its residents to travel to other cities with known clusters. The site of the Games itself is locked down and fenced off, with athletes, journalists and workers all required to stay within the Olympic Village. Those coming to Beijing must be tested within 48 hours before departure and again within 72 hours of arrival. With its zero-tolerance COVID strategy, the Chinese government has already locked down the western city of Xi'an, as well as placing harsh restrictions on Tianjin near Beijing and Zhuhai near Macau. It's now asking Beijing residents not to travel at all for the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday, one of the country's busiest travel periods. Many, though, have already left, fearing a new lockdown in the capital. France's parliament gave final approval to the government's latest measures to tackle the COVID-19 virus, including a vaccine pass contested by anti-vaccine protesters. It's the end of the health pass and access to public places will now require a vaccine pass. This will apply to everyone over 16 to access places such as bars, restaurants, cinemas and theatres. This also applies to inter-regional transport including planes and trains. However, a negative test will be enough to enter hospitals. Young people between 12 and 15 are exempt. The health pass will be enough, but parents are divided. The new rules come with more checks. In bars, restaurants and cinemas, the identity of customers could be checked, where fraud is suspected. The manager of this restaurant thinks the checks are excessive. If someone wants to cheat the rules, they will. It's not for us to deal with that. Those presenting a false pass can be given up to three years in prison and a 45,000 euro fine. The rules could come into force by the end of next week. 
The Omicron surge could be peaking in some cities with daily infections slowing down in some cities. For hospitals, things could get worse with more COVID patients seeking care and treatment as many staff are out sick with the virus themselves in the United States. Tonight, Omicron impacting millions of Americans and hospitals across the country in dire mode, bracing for the demand of more patients. Staffing shortages are a challenge as healthcare workers fight the virus themselves. In California, ambulances are facing long delays and some scheduled surgeries are being postponed. In Oregon, hundreds of procedures are on hold. Massachusetts General Hospital System will postpone more than 2,000 surgeries each week, bracing for an influx of patients. But there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Cities like Chicago, Washington, D.C., and New York seen hospitalizations plateau and some dips in the number of daily cases. Overall, the, the prognosis, the forecast for COVID is much brighter than it had been before, and that is very positive news. Yet for many, it will be too little, too late, as the spread of Omicron continues. Under Australia's immigration laws, Djokovic cannot be granted another visa for three years. However, the tennis star could return to Australia sooner than anticipated following his deportation, according to the country's prime minister. The top men's player was deported on Sunday after losing a visa battle that centred on the fact that he is unvaccinated. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Timothy Philip, who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy, what's the state of Djokovic right now? Yes, Jenna. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, however, said he could be allowed entry sooner under the right circumstances. Australian law does provide for compelling or compassionate reasons for the three-year visa ban to be waived. This would potentially allow Djokovic to take part in the Australian Open tournament next year. This year's tournament, which has been overshadowed by the unvaccinated players' visa troubles, began in Melbourne today. Djokovic had been scheduled to play later in the day, but his dramatic deportation just hours before ended his hopes of winning a record 21st Grand Slam title at the event. Djokovic was forced to leave Australia after judges upheld a decision by Immigration Minister Alex Hawke to cancel his visa on public health grounds. The decision marked the end of a tumultuous 10-day saga where the Serb fought to stay and defended his title. The legal battle reached its conclusion when judges upheld the government's decision, leaving Djokovic with no other option but to leave the country. Back to you, Shana. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Timothy Philip, reporting from Melbourne in Australia. As an underwater volcano in the South Pacific erupted violently during the weekend, causing tsunamis to hit Hawaii, Japan and Tonga's largest island, Australia and New Zealand sent surveillance flights to assess damage to tsunami hit Tonga. Two people drowned off a beach in northern Peru, the local civil defence authority reported on Sunday. After unusually high waves were recorded in several coastal areas following Saturday's eruption of an underwater volcano in Tonga in the Pacific Ocean. The Peruvian police said on Twitter that the two victims were found dead by officers. They are the first recorded deaths of the wide reaching tsunami. Meanwhile, Tonga remained largely uncontactable on Sunday with telephone and internet links severed. The official death toll in Tonga and surrounding islands remains unknown, leaving relatives in faraway New Zealand praying for their families. Here was Prime Minister Dear Jacinda Ardern. I know many of you will have seen the footage and found it deeply concerning. Since then, the New Zealand government has been urgently attempting to gather information about the situation on the ground in Tonga and the Pacific as well as issuing local warnings relating to strong waves and surges on the New Zealand coastline. In Japan, hundreds of thousands of people were advised to evacuate on Sunday as waves of more than a metre hit coastal areas, public broadcaster NHK reported. The underwater volcano off Tonga erupted on Saturday, prompting tsunami warnings and evacuation orders and causing huge waves on several South Pacific islands. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now to the escalating tensions between Russia and the west of the United States. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken reaffirmed U.S. support for Ukraine's sovereignty in the face of increasing Russian threats. Newly released video showing Ukrainian troops training on their eastern border on high alert. U.S. officials warn the Russian military is in position to move quickly and potentially invade if Putin says the word. With more than 100,000 troops already amassing at the border, this unverified social media video examined by independent researchers seeming to show Russia moving even more troops and heavy equipment west. And the Biden administration believes Russian operatives are already inside Ukraine and could soon be planning to stage an incident, a so-called false flag operation that Putin would then use as a pretext for invasion. Adding to the escalating tension, cyber attacks on Ukrainian websites. Microsoft flagging destructive malware in systems belonging to several Ukrainian government agencies and organizations that work closely with the Ukrainian government. If it turns out that uh, Russia is pummeling uh, Ukraine with cyber attacks, and if that continues over the period ahead, uh, we will work with our allies on the appropriate response. The White House says they will be ready with heavy hitting sanctions. But in a recent interview, the Kremlin spokesperson seeming to brush that threat aside. I would like just to ask people in Washington, can you recall any example of a situation when sanctions uh, helped you to solve a problem. The eastern half of the United States have already been hit with a massive snowstorm. A total of 100 million Americans are under some sort of weather alert. The snow is still coming down on the national nation's capital and there are wide-range power outages. A dangerous mix of snow, sleet and freezing rain crippling the Carolinas. Heavy snow bearing Greenville, a wintry mess in Charlotte, and treacherous travel in Raleigh. The ice, you can't see it, and when you do, it's too late. So, you know, there again, it's not worth the risk. Spinouts piling up on the interstate. Our state highway patrol advises staying off the roads in most parts of the state on Sunday and Monday if you can. At Charlotte's airport, nearly all flights grounded. The high impact storm knocking out power to tens of thousands in the southeast. Officials warning that 750,000 customers in North and South Carolina could see outages extend for days if the icing gets worse. At least four governors declaring states of emergency. Overnight, near whiteout conditions in Arkansas to steady snow in Georgia. Stores hit hard with supply chain issues are struggling to keep up with storm demands. Extreme weather also striking southwest Florida. A reported EF2 tornado leaving behind a path of destruction, destroying dozens of mobile homes across three communities near Fort Myers. This happened so fast it was just unbelievable. This really came, it came hard and it came fast. And the storm isn't slowing down. Up next, the Northeast. Prince Harry is seeking a judicial review against the refusal of the Home Office to allow him to personally pay for police protection when in the United Kingdom. The US-based Duke of Sussex says his private security team does not have adequate jurisdiction abroad. Britain's Prince Harry is challenging a government decision that he should not receive police protection when on British soil, even if he covers the cost himself, his legal representative said. Harry and his wife Meghan quit royal duties in 2020 to forge new careers in Los Angeles. The couple has since relied upon a private security team, but his legal representative said that these arrangements did not give the prince the level of protection he needed while visiting Britain, citing an incident in July 2021 where they said his security had been compromised whilst leaving a charity event. With the lack of police protection comes too great a personal risk, the statement said. Prince Harry hopes that his petition after close to two years of pleas for security in the UK will resolve this situation. Harry's mother, Princess Diana, died in a car crash in 1997 while trying to escape the paparazzi. The prince's lawyers said the government has previously dismissed two offers to pay for his police protection. Harry sought a judicial review in September 2021, according to the statement. His lawyers decided to make that information public due to a leak in the British press. 
A government spokesperson said that the UK protective security system was rigorous and proportionate and that it was its long-standing policy not to provide detailed information on any arrangement as this could compromise individual security. South Korean President Moon Jae-in, who is in the UAE for a working visit, met with the country's Prime Minister to discuss areas of bilateral interests. The two sides inked an MOU for a major defence deal, while President Moon also prompted South Korea's bid to host the Expo 2030 in Busan. South Korea will sell mid-range surface-to-air missiles, also known as the Cheonggung-2, to the United Arab Emirates. The two sides signed an MOU following talks on Sunday between President Moon Jae-in and Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, UAE Prime Minister and ruler of Dubai. President Moon is in the UAE for a working visit, part of a week-long trip that will also take him to Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Although the specifics have yet to be disclosed, the deal is expected to be worth around 3.5 billion US dollars, the largest in the country's defense history. The UAE becomes the first importer of the missile, which is designed to intercept hostile missiles below an altitude of 40 kilometers. President Moon said he was happy to ink MOUs on mid- to long-term defense cooperation and defense technology cooperation, and the deal for Cheonggung-2 went smoothly. He also called for continued efforts so it leads to reciprocal cooperation like joint research and development, production within the UAE and joint entry into third markets. President Moon also called for interest from the UAE for South Korea's efforts to host the Expo 2030 in the southern city of Busan and asked Dubai to share its successful experience of hosting the Expo 2020. Before the talks, the South Korean leader visited the Expo to attend a ceremony for Korea Day to promote the country's bid. Earlier on Sunday, President Moon attended a business roundtable on hydrogen cooperation, as Seoul seeks to expand its horizon of energy cooperation with the oil-rich nation. He said if the two sides work together, they can create synergy, given the UAE's potential to produce blue hydrogen, which is derived from natural gas, and South Korea's ability to utilize it. In fact, the UAE is the first partnership which South Korea has to import hydrogen produced overseas. The UAE is taking proactive measures to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, a goal shared by South Korea. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Former president of Mali died at the age of 76, who led the West African country from 2013 until he was ousted in a coup in 2020, died at the age of 76 in Bamako. Polish border guards have detained several people accused of trafficking migrants from the Polish-Belarusian border towards Western Europe. The FBI is combing the scene near the congressional Beth Israel synagogue, where authorities say a gunman held four people hostage for nearly 12 hours before his death. The hostage taker demanded the release of a convicted murderer currently serving time in federal prison. North Korea supposedly launched two more ballistic missiles, making this the fourth launch this month. This has been heavily criticized by the Joint Chiefs of Staff of U.S.-Korea. The South Korean officials have urged North Korea to keep in mind its diplomatic obligations, regardless of the measures they resort to in establishing internal stability. China has reported economic growth of 4% in the final quarter of last year, slightly above the market's pessimistic expectations. But it's a slowdown for the third straight quarter as Beijing continues to struggle with a weak property market as well as supply bottlenecks. China's economy saw a weak finish to 2021, extending its slowdown in the final quarter. According to China's National Bureau of Statistics on Monday, the country's economic growth in the fourth quarter of last year further slowed to 4 percent. That follows the slowdown in the previous two quarters, giving the country an annual GDP growth of 8.1 percent, mainly from the huge growth in the first quarter, which came due to the base effect. That annual figure was still above the modest goal of above 6 percent previously set by the Chinese government. The seemingly disappointing Q4 figure, however, was higher than the market expectations, which were below 4 percent. 
Bloomberg had forecast China's Q4 GDP to grow 3.5 percent and 8 percent for 2021. The slowdown was widely expected as the country struggled with both internal and external headwinds. Experts say the Chinese economy was dragged down by a weaker property market and a fallout from the Evergrande crisis as Beijing tightened its grip on debt in the property sector. Street COVID-19 measures, surging prices of raw materials and global supply bottlenecks also put a strain on China's growth engine. And the grim outlook for the country continues into the new year. Citing the property market slowdown as the biggest threat in the near term, U.S. investment bank J.P. Morgan earlier projected the country's economy will grow 4.9% in 2022. Goldman Sachs revised down its 2022 growth forecast to 4.3 percent based on the ongoing pandemic. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with a look at rich selections of lunar New Year flowers and bonsais that have ushered a peak season ahead of the Spring Festival in China. Thank you for joining us. Good night.